Greetings once again, Frosty the News program here with your host, Brother Dan Goodwin, here in the studio again for our third program with Dr. Charles Hiltabittle. Good to see you, my brother. Good to be here. And we have had a time, uh, we didn't plan on doing this third show, but when we get done the second one, I, I said, we're not done yet. There's just, uh, for a little 127-page book, um, I mean, we just there's, just, there's just more we got to share. I thought I'd start the program today with the... Uh, uh, a rapture verse for mm -hmm. us today because since we're talking about a book called the seven reasons for the rapture let's read a verse here in fir, uh, first thessalonians chapter 4 um, paul says in verse 13 i would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep or dead mm -hmm. um, but that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope we have hope because we have a place that Amen. we're going one day and uh, death, uh, death is sorrowful, but, but in a different way for yes. the Christian. When we lose a loved one that's saved, we know that we'll see them again. Mm -hmm. But uh, you read on a little further here, verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus, yeah. that's talking about death now for the saints, mm -hmm. sleep in Jesus. Um, let's see, uh, even those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Uh, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, talking about him coming for the saints, yep. shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, mm. with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them Amen. in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he ends with this yes. statement that we leave off. Yep. Wherefore, comfort one another That's right. with these words. Amen. Folks, I'm hoping that what we're talking about will be a comfort to you. True. Because the Lord's coming back and he's going to take us out of this old sin cursed world and he's going to redeem this planet. He's going to he's going to take back the title deed to the earth yes. and we're going to come back with him after that. Seven years is over. We're going to rule and reign down here during the kingdom age. And uh, so we brought Dr. Hiltabittle back with us for a third time to uh, to bring comfort because we're talking Amen. about the rapture. It is. All right. What we've got here, we've got two books, Doc, that you have written. This one's brand new. Seven reasons for the rapture. And that's the main thing that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but you've also got a book called Jerusalem, A Cup of Trembling. And we haven't talked too much about this one. Not that it's not important, but it's just we've mainly been discussing right. your new book about the rapture. When I say this is not a new book, it's, it's not a, it's, it was a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it's, it's not in the bookstores. Uh, all, probably nobody listening to this program has ever seen this book. Probably not. And uh, we're, we're giving a package deal on the program for both books. Um, just call the number on your screen or go to the website and you can get them both. Uh, I think we will talk a little bit about this one today uh, in the program uh, because I think uh, I think there's some interesting stuff in here. You know, Jerusalem ought to be interesting to us. Uh, amen. I was there in 2017, my wife and I. Uh, it does something to you. There's it, something about that place. It does. Uh, and the nation yes. of Israel. And uh, um, and it's called the cup of trembling. That's right out of the word of God. Yes. A cup of trembling. And uh, everybody wants that city. Everybody wants that place. And uh, there's been wars there for hundreds of years. Yes. And uh, Israel's been in and out of their land yes. and their, their bag. And you, you deal with all that yes. in this little book. Um, you've got on the back of the book here, you've got some little quotes that are mm -hmm. in the book. I'll just read some of it. Jerusalem has been destroyed twice, besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times. Captured and recaptured 44 times throughout history. Today, it once again, it is once again the focal point of the turmoil in the Middle East. Yep. Uh, terms being used by politicians and the media forming false ideas of, uh, of Israel and Jerusalem are in everyday occurrence. Such as the words Jewish settlers or settlements. Yep. East Jerusalem, West Bank, occupied territories. These, we hear this every day yep. on the news. Uh, and other misguided terms that give a false impression to the unsuspecting masses of the world, many of them right here in America, right. unsuspecting yep. masses. 
All this to make Israel look bad in the eyes of the world when they all are untruths used to stir up more anti-Semitism. That's it. Share some of that with us. Well, terms, West Bank and all of that showing to be, hey, all of that land was given to Abraham and the Bible says to his seed forever. And uh, we were, last week we talked about a prompt. God promises things. He can't yeah, change his mind, right? He, he keeps his promise. And so the idea of all of that and the idea that there's such a entity as Palestinians, which is nothing but a movement uh, to try to reclaim the property uh, for Esau. That's called the Edenic, you know, Esau, right. uh, his followers. They, well, anyway, it's all terms used to cause people to think that Israel is a occupier of somebody else's property. No, it's other, by other people settling where God's given to Israel. And so I deal with that some in the book. All right. And of course, we, we, we mentioned already last week or the week before about the, the World War I. A, a Jew invented something that helped win the war yeah. and saved Israel. Mm -hmm. And yep. they, the Balfour Agreement mm -hmm. came after that. Yep. World War II, of course, the atomic age yep. was Jews that created the atomic yep. bombs. And, and uh, uh, it's amazing that the, the Jewish scientists, if you look at Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winners. Oh, yeah. The greater majority of them, I mean, the greater majority of them are, yeah. are Jews. And, uh, yeah, the world owes a lot to the Jews. And, of course, Genesis 12, 3 yeah. talks about That's that. right. Absolutely. And, uh, that they have given to the world. They have. Cures. Uh, there's a there's a cancer cure yeah, we're talking about yeah. now. Jeru Israel claims, and I put it on my Facebook page. Israel claims that uh, they are they have a cure for cancer within a year. Yep. Now you can imagine what's going to happen in the next year if it's true. You can see the opposition from the the pharmaceuticals yeah. and the drug companies, and they're going to fight that because sure. there's billions, maybe trillions of dollars in the. I'm cancer sure it's more in the trillions, world. and there's no. No profit in curing anybody. <laughs> Look, they'll kill you on the street for ten dollars. What will they do for a trillion dollars? Yeah, I mean they'll they'll kill the whole nation for that. Yep. But, um, but yeah, uh, there's great miracles, and uh, of course, what do we owe the Jews? The scriptures, amen. The Savior, mm -hmm. and, and many other things, amen. I mean, yeah, uh, they brought you know the salvation is of the Jews. The Bible says they brought the Messiah into the world. The very oracles of God came yep. from the Jews. The oracles of God, of course, is the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's many things that we owe to the Jews. Well, the title, you know, is a uh, you know, cup of trembling. That's what God said uh, through the pen of, uh, uh, you know, Zechariah, that it would be a cup of trembling. He would make it a cup of trembling. Yeah. And that tells me the fever pitch of our world against Jerusalem tells me that we must be very close to the end of it all. Yeah, yeah, and boy, you know, we've read the last chapter of the book. We we know how it all ends, which mm -hmm. is amazing. We, we we know how it ends. Amen. But Israel could be destroyed in five minutes. I mean, one bomb could wipe the place right. out, and uh, that'd be it. I mean, the whole the whole holy city and everything could be gone. And we know that's not going to happen. But the truth is, we know we're near the end because we know what's go we know that Israel is surrounded by all enemies. of the prophecies of the end times surrounding Israel, whether it's the uh, whether it's what we're seeing, the Gog Magog forming in Syria now or or the uh, Islamic Caliphate and all these things. You're seeing all of the you're seeing the kings of the east, I believe, with China and and Korea and all of that. Over I, I, all of these things are, are centering toward Jerusalem. Yeah, amazing. Well, we're talking, to, we're talking with Dr. Charles Hiltabittle again, and you have uh, become a familiar face here on the program. I think this is your fifth appearance here. We have to charge you for the next oh, one, but okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, we've been talking mostly about this book, The yes. Seven Reasons for the Rapture. And, Doc, I was, uh, I was tickled to death uh, to see in the back, you put a little chapter in the back that really didn't go with the book. And At uh, first, I... I had it in part of the book, and one of the one of the precious preacher friends of mine, who's uh, very very sharp in his skills, uh, helped in some of the editing of it. And he sent a note, and he said, "You need to consider putting this in a separate section, all on its own, because it really doesn't fit in 
to the theme of what your mm -hmm. book is. So that's why it's put in the back. Cause and I, if I was, said I'm going to put it in the book. If it was on the front page, maybe people would read the, the headline and put uh, the book back well, on the shelf. They might. Uh, where they're going to read the book. This is at the back. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about the King James Bible. Yes. Uh, page 109, additional thoughts. Why I use the King James Bible. Let's see, how many pages is this? One, two, three. Um, this is... Uh, um, I don't know. It's several pages mm -hmm. where you talk about this this subject. I'm glad you did. I wrote a book in 2009, I think it was, called Hath God Said. Mm -hmm. It's a little 80 or 90, maybe it's 100 pages. I don't know, but it's a little book. Uh, my sister did a sketch of the of the Garden of e Garden of Eden scene with the mm -hmm. serpent and uh, Eve. Couldn't find a picture on the internet that was modest. So yeah. you know, how do you put <laughs> Eve on the cover of your book? Yeah. So my sister drew something. She has her behind the the bushes, or where you you know, um, and it's got the serpent there. And uh, I think one of the pictures she did, she put a uh, a college graduate uh, cap, like a doctor of. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, because that's the crowd that seems to be getting us. The, well, the, we the church turned over the responsibility of the authority of Scripture during this Laodicean world that we're living in to academia and science. Th yeah. There's supposedly no more about it than the, uh, I'm going to just take by faith, I'm going to receive the received text. I'm going to receive it from the faithful ones before me. I'm not going to trust this crowd out here that believes in evolution to begin with. You know, D.L. Moody had an eighth grade education. And he was a little embarrassed about it. He wished that he had more yeah. education. His, some of his words weren't real good. Sure. and. Do you know what? That man reached two continents. Absolutely. God. And, uh, you know, we've made a God out of education, but education is killing us. Yeah. And I'm for I'm for learning. Absolutely. I'm for studying. But, I mean, uh, we're learning stuff that we shouldn't be learning in schools now. Mm -hmm. and, and we're putting our faith in professors. Well, most of the educational systems, whether it's uh, in the public school or even, even in Bible colleges, it's more for indoctrination than it is for education. So let's just take a, a minute, a couple of minutes here. You, you, you very kind. You were very kind in here. Very kindly uh, made the statement that you're, you're, you use the King James Bible mm -hmm. without an apology. And uh, but why? I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to make it an area where I'm going to separate my uh, uh, fellowship to a certain degree with somebody unless they want to fellow break it. Yeah. Um, but I want them to understand I. This is why I use the King James. And I don't want to be mean about it, but I, I feel like that I'm right about it. And I think I ought to, as the author, I, I think they ought to know where I stand on an issue. I was with a, a young cu a couple, in fact, a, a supporter of my ministry that I've recently met. His name is uh, David. I was with him and his daughter. We were at a, a restaurant. They, they, he drove a long way to, to meet with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got done, we, we went outside, and his daughter had a Bible. And I had never looked in an ESV. I've never opened one. Never had one, never opened one. And uh, she had an ESV Bible, but she pretty much was a King James person. But she had a, happened to have an ESV Bible. And uh, I had never looked at one, so I wasn't sure. But I said, hey, well, turn to Matthew 18, verse 11 in that Bible. And she started <laughs> thumbing through there. And I wasn't sure because, like I said, I'd never had an ESV. I knew that the NIV omitted it. Mm -hmm. Matthew 18, 11 is not, is not in the NIV Bible and many other Bibles. Um, so she looked in her ESV, ESV, the English Standard Version, and sure enough, it was not there. And she was quite surprised. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you know what that verse says? It says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Yep. And she said, why did they take that out? I said, well, that's... Ask the authors of yeah, it. Yeah, you're going to have yep. to... That's, that's just one example. Yep. And uh, so people say, well, what's the big deal? I think that's a pretty big deal, that there's a yes. verse missing, one of hundreds of verses missing. Yes. So I am a King James man. I don't, uh, I don't get, get mad at people. No. I preach at conferences. I'll be surrounded by people who, who do not use the King James. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to correct them. I'm there to preach and teach what they've asked me to come and do. I use my King James Bible without apology. I preach what I believe is the Word of God. You made a statement in, in here, and I, I don't remember where it is. You, you'll, you'll remember. You said something about 
to do with two guys studying out of two different Bibles. Do you remember what I'm talking about and how, yeah. how, how can you do that? And yeah, because, well, the bottom line is the King James Bible comes from a different text and a different body of, of, of materials. And uh, so if you're, if you're having, a preacher told me the other day that he was in a setting where there were four different Bibles and everybody had a different idea of what it meant. And not a one of them meant the exact same thing. That sounds like confusion to me. Well, but God's not the author of confusion. Well, you know, recently we had the uh, the hoax out there of Revelation chapter twelve, and the uh, all that was. We we understand that that's a history lesson that God's giving to bring them up to the current setting, why they're getting ready to suffer, what they have. Uh, But they were taught because they said it's a great wonder, Uh, and it's a it's a great because the wording that was used is different Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a big difference in those things and so the 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 way in which new texts or new bibles so to speak the way they are translated is not not only from a different text but by a different method our bible is is a line for line word for word translation now our, our museum creation evidences museum glen rose texas we have a rather large collection that we own of actual artifacts used in the King James translation. We own the personal New Testament, Nicholas Corbelius, the head translator. And uh, in it, uh, Cambridge University spent 10 days looking that over, researching it. And they're the ones who told us what we had. Mm. And we, if you look at it closely, you'll find Every single word is underlined in that Greek Bible. Wow. And uh, so the, the mode of translation has changed to uh, conceptual interpretation. In other words, well, the context meant that over here, but in our world and its context, I mean, that puts the, the author of that in charge of the Bible. You know, we need to let this be the charge you know, of the our You the biggest lives. scam portrayed upon the Christianity today and I say this in my new book, The Seven Clocks. I have a chapter about the, 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 the church is a ticking clock, talks mm-hmm. about the church loses the scriptures in the last days. That's, right. That's where we're at. The biggest scam played on, the, on, on Christianity today is the, is the statement, in the originals it says, <laughs> or this should say this because mm-hmm. in the originals mm-hmm. there are no, and I was glad, happy to see that you there said no the originals. same thing. There are no originals anywhere on planet Earth. I have a double dog dare you in my new book. <laughs> People laugh about it. I said I double dog dare any and I, I'll double dog anybody watching this program today. I'll double dog I'll triple dog dare you <laughs> to prove me wrong about that. There you find an original anything written by Moses, Paul, anybody, yeah. Peter. There are no original manuscripts anywhere on planet Earth. Right. There were no originals in Jesus' day when he walked the earth. The oldest manuscript that I've seen, and I saw it in the Sumerian village, and they have the oldest Torah that we know of existence. Mm-hmm. But it's by no means right. the original. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, nope. though they're a wonderful historical yep. document, which I'm and told v- line up with the King James v- Bible, they too, do. by the way. And very enlightening. Yes. So, yeah. listen, you either by faith going to believe you got the Word of God. For well, look, uh, if, if God could place an eternal soul in Adam and pass eternal life onto a soul in every conception following it, why can't God preserve his book and it just as real today yes, sir. as it was the day he gave it? And, uh, yeah. Great. Folks, if, if you're interested in that subject of the Word of God, there's some in his book. Uh, I think it's important. So I think it's the number one topic of importance in the world, the, the Word of God. Yeah. He's magnified his word above, even above his, his name. name. Yes. So, but you said something a moment ago about God preserving a soul that leads us to our next question. Yes. On another subject here. But first, let me tell the folks how, uh, how you can get the, the, the information here. Dr. Hiltabittle's books are on the website, crossingnews.com. You can get them there. They've got a package deal there for you. And uh, I highly recommend you get them. They're very, very easy to read. Good, a good read. It'll help you. Um, or you can call the 800 number on your screen during business hours, and they'll take your order over the phone. So, all right, we got a, we got about uh, seven or eight minutes left, Doc. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you mentioned a minute ago about Adam and God preserving his soul yeah. and the fact that God can preserve his word, which he yeah. has, and I have it. Um, but you say in the, in, the book, uh, in the book here, you say that the soul of every human being that has ever lived is still alive today, is forever alive. It's forever alive. Explain that. Well, we are an eternal soul. We we see the we see the tabernacle that we're housed in, mm -hmm. and uh, thankfully we we have variations in all of that. But our soul and our spirit, we are eternal. So when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and Adam became a living soul, in some way God reaches into eternity and places an everlasting, forever alive soul in Adam. And our souls is forever alive, but we are in the bounds of creation. And creation is held in the parameters of time. Everything that we know is in the realm of time. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, it's the first three words of the Bible. Uh, uh, and so time comes before space and matter. So everything in the bounds of time is all that we know. But we are an eternal soul. Mm -hmm. And we're going to live forever. We cannot live forever in this body. That's right. Now, the first body was designed evidently because even after sin in the pre-flood world, they lived to be nearly a thousand years after mm -hmm. sin. And it is obvious the world in its original creation was designed similar to a, an atomic power plant uh, for and even had the tree of life in the garden. Uh, God had it designed so that it was a perpetual foreverness because that's our souls. But now that we're in a sin-cursed world that's destined to a destruction and a replacement, we have to have a replacement. That's why Paul talks about the change that we have. This mortal must put on immortality. Uh, and so our, our eternal souls, in order to, to experience eternity, we, we have to have a body that's designed that's not in the constraints right. of time. Now on that same line or similar, on page 97, you've got a little statement here, one, one of them little headlines. Will we know each other in heaven? I get that. That's probably yeah. the second most asked question mm -hmm. I get. Brother Goodman, will, will I know, will we know each other? Will I know my daughter? Will I know my mother? And of course, I, I know what Evan, I tell people, but share, I, share I, with I, the listeners. I, I'm confident we will. The uh, Bible says we'll know even as we are known. Right. But uh, just take Jesus after his resurrection. Um, of course, the guys on the road to Emmaus, they, they yeah, weren't certain. I think certain. he hid himself from them. I think he hid himself from them. But, but when he prayed, it was revealed. Yeah. And, oh, my. But, but, it, but his new body walked through solid closed locked doors mm -hmm. while they were gathered in the upper room. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to have a new body that's you know, on not the Mount a miraculous of Transfiguration. Structure. Yeah. They, they, they knew. At, they had never met Moses. No, but they obviously. knew him. Yeah, they knew Moses and Elijah. Yeah, it's, and that's man, we need to build three tabernacles. Yeah, you know. and I, of course, I, I always joke with folks. I said, uh, of course, we're going to know each other in heaven. Are we going to be dumber there than we are here? Yeah, we know each other here. Are we going to be dumber up there? No. Yeah, I, we'll, I, uh, we'll I don't know what the new body will be like, but it's obvious uh, that got to uh, be better than this one, brother. But they recognize Jesus after his resurrection. Yeah. You know, and uh, all right. Yes. Uh, let's go to some of the reasons um, in the time we have. Uh, reason number four, it is, I wrote down here, it is determined. Reasons yeah. for the rapture, it is determined. Yeah. Uh, well, number one, the, the final years of prophecy are determined because Daniel's prophecy uh, began in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. This is determined upon thy people right. and thy holy city. So, so, the, so the tribulation is determined. And, and I'm confident that the tribulation cannot begin until the rapture takes place. So it's a determined fact. We're going to be out of here so final years of prophecy can be fulfilled. Yeah. It's a, it's a, first of all, notice God says, this is from your book here. God, notice God says it is determined. You're, you're quoting from mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 9, of course. Yeah. You'll never understand prophecy That's if right. you don't understand Daniel 9. That's right. And every Bible college I know of, if they teach a Revelation class, it's mm -hmm. Daniel and Rev Revelation. Right. They go together. Um, Seventy weeks to determine upon thy people. Determined, determined, yep. determined. And, and it's going to happen. Yes, God it said it, it's going to happen. It's a done deal. And upon the holy city, thy holy city, that's Jerusalem. Got to be. 
to, uh, see, he didn't say New York City. He's nope. not talking about the church. He's talking about Jerusalem, right. Israel. To finish, and he gives a whole list of the reasons for the tribulation. And the last one's the best, to anoint the most holy. Yep. Jesus is going to be anointed. Amen. And uh, the Lord of the Rings that I talk about so often, the Lord of the Rings movies, the most prophetic movie I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. 11 hours, not one cuss word, not one immodest scene in it. Just unbelievable. And the last movie, which comes from the three books from Tolkien, the last movie or the last book is called Bringing Back the King. And at the end of the movie, they're up on that big thing yeah. or whatever you call it. Um, and, and they're anointing him as the king. It's, it's a picture of Christ coming back, taking back the kingdom and being anointed king of kings and lord of lords. That's Daniel 9 right here. Yep. That's the end of the tribulation when he comes back on the white horse. And, uh, and then you say, first of all, God's, uh, notice God says it's determined. I take it that if God has determined, then it's a done deal. Uh, with no ifs or questions about it. Yeah. I mean, I like that. I mean, that's cut and dry. So, well, I'm just a country boy, and I just yeah, I, I just want it simple and understandable. Well, the audience likes this country boy here. They, uh, the, the folks, have enjoyed your uh, your being on the program here, and we're just about out of time. Um, but speaking of time, you mm -hmm. had something to say about eternity and the fact of you got you got to get saved here. Or you can't right. get saved. We got, we got about a minute and a half. Time. Well, the Bible says, even in Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son mm -hmm. made of a woman. And so God came into time and took upon himself the form of man, not the nature of man, because man's nature is lost. Right. Took upon himself the form of man as a servant and willfully went to Calvary's cross in time. So on Calvary's cross, he shed his innocent blood so that he could then, as a high priest, apply it in heaven on the judgment seat. And once the ply, uh, blood is applied to the judgment seat, it becomes the mercy seat. So thank God for the mercy. Amen. And you have to get saved this side yes. of heaven because so he came no into time right. and provided redemption. There's no salvation or redemption for a fallen angel because there's no way of death in eternity. So God came into time, died on the cross, shed his blood at, in time. And it's only while you as an eternal soul living in a temporary body in time can access redemption. Folks, you heard it. If you're going to get saved, you've got to get saved this side yes. of time. You've got to get saved here inside of time. If you die and you leave this planet, you leave this universe in yes. death, it's too late, my friend. That's right. You've got to get saved. If you need some help with that, call the number on your screen. Somebody would love to share Amen. with you the way to get saved here in our in our dispensation or the our dimension time. of time, yes. this universe. Um, so it's been great having you, Doc. Thank Thanks you. for coming again and doing another show. And you out there, God bless you and keep looking up.